Hi, hello. Uh, my name is Kuba. I'm working as a software engineer in security team at Yelp. And I'm here to uh, tell you today about how we automated our malware response at Yelp. So first, a couple words about me. I started at uh, Yelp around two years ago. And since then, I've been mostly involved in our malware incident response process. And also, in the meantime, automating and uh, basically uh, working on our security processes. Uh, before that, I used to work at SAP in Sofia Antipolis in France in a security and trust research group. And prior to that, I was studying in Krakow and also doing joint degree uh, with the University of Telecom Paritech, this is Eurocom, also in Sofia Antipolis. So just sort of a quick recap, Yelp's mission is to connect people with great local businesses. And this led over the past 12 years since uh, the company started to over uh, 102 million reviews, as you can see on this slide. 90 million of the users are coming from the mobile websites and applications. Around 70% of the searches are also from mobile and, and web apps, uh, mobile apps and uh, basically our mobile app uh, website. And right now Yelp, Yelp is present in 32 countries worldwide. So what I'm trying to say by showing you all the stats is basically that we have more than 4,000 employees by now. And most of them are actually using uh, MacBooks to do their daily job. So sort of a quick interaction to our malware incident response process. Uh, this sort of starts when one of our employees gets uh, an alert, either like some detection by our endpoint monitoring software or some network monitoring stuff. Uh, that detects some suspicious binaries on the user's machine or some suspicious tra network traffic coming from, from a particular machine. Uh, but just let me first introduce you sort of to uh, people involved in all this process. So first we'll have a Yelp employee uh, who typically uses MacBook to perform his daily duties. And from time to time they will wander to some gray sides of the internet, right? For instance, get alert to download uh, latest update to Adobe Flash Player or some free video converter app which comes packaged with malware also for free. Uh, we have help desk engineers, so they are kind of serving as an interface uh, between users and us, the security team. Um, help desk engineers are the best people to perform all this task. They have best outreach to the users in terms of both uh, different time zones and different uh, locations because Yelp is also present in uh, various locations around the globe. In, uh, our offices are in various locations around the globe. And we have also a security team uh, that is also uh, consisting of malware analysts, so the people who are basically in charge of analyzing the uh, alerts about malware on malware infections on someone's machines. So job of malware analysts is typically to answer these three questions, how the malware got there in the first place, uh, is the machine even infected or not? And how we can prevent and detect further infections to sort of uh, stop spreading malware all over our uh, company infrastructure. So there used to be lots of false positive in our approach, uh, in, in the alerts we were, we were receiving. So we started involving malware analysts as early in the process as possible. So we are doing this initial triage. And this is basically to establish whether uh, this is a real alert or a false positive, whether it's something like uh, Windows threat on Mac OS machines that we don't really care about. And this is sort of to save us time from all these other tasks like forensics collection and forensics analysis. So we can weave out, as uh, filter out sort of as quickly as possible whether this is a real threat or not. This is always saving us some time. Um, but our traditional sort of approach involved later on after this initial triage, uh, basically collecting forensics from the, from the machine. I'll tell about uh, this a bit more in, in the next slides. This task used to be performed by our help desk ninja. So they're like, as I mentioned, the, the best people to do it because they are really living close to the users. They can just uh, go grab someone's machines, take it off the network, uh, run the necessary collection scripts, get the output back, and then the malware analyst can start, uh, start analyzing the output so they can assess the risk related to the infection. 
So when it comes to different kind of tools we have available for digital forensics collection on Mac OS, there is OSX Auditor. So this is script that more or less uh, inactive for the past few, few months. Uh, it's open source on GitHub. It lets you collect different properties from, the, from Mac OS machines. There is OS Query, which also uh, is open source project, open source by Facebook. It allows you to query different system properties uh, like you will be querying SQL database. Knock Knock is also quite useful tool that lets you figure out which processes are running on your Mac OS machines. So this may give you more insights into whether there are some known processes like system processes or something that was actually installed by the user, potentially packaged with malware. Uh, there is Google Rapid Response Framework. This is a bit more intrusive. They let you, for instance, collect file samples. So it also gives you more insights into in, in, in terms of whether the machine is infected with something or not, because they, they give you possibility to collect the samples of the files from the machines as well. I'd like to also mention a book that was recently released. It's OS 10 Incident Response Scripting Analysis by Jaron Bradley. Uh, this book also comes with kind of ideas for scripts that you can uh, basically have to collect various forensics from, from Mac OS machines and also gives you some ideas about how to analyze them. At Yelp, we use uh, OSX Collector, which is a tool based on OSX Editor. It's also open source on GitHub. Uh, so this is a forensic evidence uh, collection analysis toolkit for OS X. Uh, we open sourced it some two years ago. It was actually the first project I worked on when I joined Yelp, so I'm pretty proud of it that it's still up there and still used by uh, people. Actually, let me get a quick show of hands how many of you are familiar with OSX Collector in the audience. A couple of hands, okay. Cool. So. Uh, basically, what OSX Collector is, is a simple Python script that uh, you run on potentially infected machine. It will uh, collect various system properties. Uh, you see it here on this slide. And then output them as a JSON file so that analysts can take this file and try to figure out uh, all these properties, whether machine is infected or not. So uh, the way OSX Collector runs is it collects, gathers all this different information from uh, PLIS, which are kind of like you would say Windows registry things on Mac OS machines. Various SQLite databases that also Mac OS uh, uses to store system properties, as well as some other local file system information for, for instance, for applications installed on in the system or uh, browser history, browser extension, things like that. So here is an example of how uh, such a JSON entry collected by OSX Collector looks like. It comes with some common keys like file paths, file hashes, timestamps. Uh, there are also signature chains, for instance, for, for binaries that might be useful to figure out whether this is something we expect on the system or not. So what we used to do later on after collecting all these files uh, from the potentially infected machine is that malware analysts would basically sit down and with some simple tools like Grab or JQ, which is actually quite a cool thing for uh, JSON visualization, uh, they will go through the scripts, basically trying to find some uh, uh, events that were happening around a certain time frame, or it will also allow you to, uh, with help of JQ, uh, filter and show only uh, URLs related to users' activity around a certain time frame. And basically, based on that, analysts will try to figure out the, where, where, for instance, the file was downloaded from, or when the file was installed by the user, trying basically to figure out answers to these questions I mentioned earlier. So this also works pretty well, but if you have 30,000 lines of JSON output, it may come as a really job of basically looking at a lot of JSON. And don't get me wrong, like I like JSON. JSON is very pretty, it is simple, uh, but it's also very easy to read and process by, by code, from code. So actually why don't we let code process the JSON output? And this is what we sort of done as the next step. So uh, early on, we automated the JSON analysis process with what we called OSX collector output filters. And they basically, what they do is they augment the initial JSON with uh, all different properties. For instance, uh, the information from our internal blacklists or information from some external threat intelligence APIs. 
they will also try to construct the list of related files to uh, files that are potentially infected and then produce some sort of summary of findings. So this is all really cool. It automates the whole kind of analysis process, but the, the, the tool itself, OSX Collector Output Filters, it was quite tedious to maintain because malware analysts had to basically get the installa installation of the tool on their machine. Uh, when they started the analysis, they had to also basically sit there, watch it running. They, if the machine went to sleep or if they decided to like close the machine or for whatever reason they lost internet connections, all this sort of process will kind of halt and then they all have to restart it because it connects to various external thread Intel APIs uh, via HTTP. So basically the tool was not written in a way that allowed them to kind of like pause it and resume it at a certain point of time. Also, not to mention that basically whenever there was like new version of this OSX collector output filters, malware analysts were in charge of themselves updating the source code, getting all of the dependencies. So it was really, really uh, tedious task and not something we were looking uh, to do uh, with the process that we were actually trying to automate. So we thought we can do better and we turned the OSX collector output filters into a service and we called this service Amira, Automated Malware Incident Response and Analysis. So right now with Amira, what analyst uh, is doing is just dropping the OSX collector output file to the S3 bucket. And Amira will automatically trigger uh, the analysis of the new object in the bucket. This is based on a uh, thing called S3 event notifications. So we have configured this S3 bucket basically to send a notification to an SQSQ whenever there is new object in this bucket. This SQSQ is called here on the slide, Amira S3 event notifications. So whenever there is uh, a new object created, a notification will be sent to this queue. Amira will periodically check for the new messages in the SQSQ. And upon receiving a new one, it will fetch the related OSX collector output file from the S3 bucket. And you can see actually the output of the OSX collector is packaged in targz file to save some space because it's like lots of JSON so we want to compress it as much as possible. So it will act, uh, Amira will also act, extract the, first decompress the file and then extract the proper JSON file from, uh, from the archive and then it will run, execute all these different analysis filters on the uh, OSX collector output file. And after all this process, it will uh, send the results of the analysis, for instance, to another S3 bucket, uh, so the malware analyst can fetch the results from, uh, from the bucket and see whether the machine was infected, basically read the whole summary of the, of the analysis process. Uh, here are the examples of the analysis results that Amira produces. So for instance, we'll see some domains and hashes that were found from the black, on the blacklist that we are curating. It will also give you an idea about information found by conducting the exter uh, external threat intelligence APIs. And then it will also provide you suggestions. So basically for the things that were found on the external uh, threat intelligence APIs but are not listed on your blacklist, it will suggest uh, you, uh, to you to, to add them to the, to the blacklist. Amira doesn't require too much configuration to run. Uh, basically, all you need to do is to figure out on your own this S3 event notifications thing. It is well documented uh, on the AWS documentation, so it's not really uh, something difficult. And then just to run it, you uh, basically need to specify SQSQ name and uh, AWS region where the queue was configured to run. There is also a possibility to specify this uh, results of loader. So there, there is, for instance, possibility to add also some other uh, results of loader. So results of loader are basically a way uh, for you to uh, tell Amira what to do with the analysis results. So you may want to add some other way of distributing the results. For instance, you may think about uh, sending the results of the analysis via email or some similar, um, or some, basically attach them to your incident response platform if you have some more. Uh, advanced system to, to triage these alerts. 
And so that's sort of why I was mentioning that kind of this S3 bucket there, the end results of the S3 bucket is, is, um, is, is optional and stuff. Are there any questions so far related to Amira? So the question is whether we are using it as a Lambda function or running it as our uh, internal instance. So we are running it as our, as our internal instance. Um, yeah, there are several factors. It, Lambda factors are really cool, but I found them quite tedious when it comes to importing some external dependencies, like basically this whole OSX cluster output filters. But our first idea was actually to think about Lambda functions. Uh, there were some other questions. Okay, if not, uh, let me continue. Uh, so actually you can go even a step further with all this forensics and also to make the forensics collection step. So basically uh, what you can do is instead of just getting the machine and running the OSX collector script on the machine, uh, you could think about uh, basically having some script that will run OSX collector on the machine and for instance, upload the results to an S3 bucket. If you have large installation in your, in your company, so like we ideally have around 4,000 employees with, with Mac OS systems, uh, you probably use something like your inventory management system. You could think of basically just dropping the script to run OSX collector collection and then uploading the results to S3 bucket. And that will trigger uh, the Amira to, to uh, Run the collection, uh, run the analysis on the on the results. Here is an example of such script. It's very basic. I actually stole it from someone else. It's the only thing it does. It's just uh, calculating this signature for AWS S3, so it can um, send the file there and, and then trigger the whole analysis process. Uh, so the whole analysis sort of. Uh, saved us a lot of time. In certain cases, it saved us up to like hours from several days. Um, we, it used to be when we were involving also help desk into the whole collection process, uh, we have to wait for them. They were in different time zones. Uh, sometimes they had to chase the user, which was also in the other time zone. Uh, so the whole process could easily take up to several days. And then the whole analysis, as I've mentioned, when it was interrupted, uh, Amira takes basically all this effort from you. You don't have to sit there and watch how it collects all the, all the uh, information from various uh, threat intelligence APIs. It also reuses lots of caching mechanisms. So all this OSX collector output filters, it comes packaged with some basic cache that will not issue the same queries. For instance, if the user visited the same uh, websites. I mean, most of the users are actually visiting probably like 80, 90% of the websites they're visiting are the same. Uh, so when we're running the process on each, by each individual malware analyst, uh, basically all, all, all of them had to pretty much get the same information all over again. And with Amira, we're just able to have this information get once from the a APIs and cache it. So, for instance, saves us lots of quota from the external APIs, and it basically makes the whole process even faster. Uh, it also cut all this interaction between the malware analysts and help desk. So right now, Amira is taking care of forensics collection, also the analysis. Obviously, there is a need for analysts to review the whole result summary and actually provide remediations that are then executed by the IT engineer uh, help desk, but before, still like there is less sort of human interaction, uh, less errors possibly that could come all over uh, along the way. Also there is no need for this physical collection, so even less uh, uh, problems with basically yeah, chasing users down the corridors and taking their machine off the network. We can just remotely run the script, collect all the forensics, get the analysis done, and then basically malware analysts can sit down and look at the analysis and figure out whether there are any false positives or we've run down any sort of uh, other uh, problems. Uh, 
And it also allowed us to uh, do more proactive uh, forensic collection. So right now, even on the machines that we are not uh, really sure that they're in fact, they're not, we, we haven't even received any alerts, but potentially there is some suspicious network activity from our DNS resolvers. Uh, we could practically run a mirror and get all of the forensics, analyze them, and then figure out whether uh, the machine is impacted or not. And the whole thing is open sourced, so go try it out. Uh, I'm really looking forward for any questions related to the project, any issues that you've spot. Uh, if you have any suggestions, also don't be shy. Create some pull requests, send them my way. I'll try to uh, review them. And on that note, I'll like to thank you for coming, and I'm open to take any questions. What kind uh, of false positive false positive percentage? I'd say it's probably way more than 80%, like around this like 80, 20 percent rule, right? So I guess some of them will be clearly false positive. Some of them will be like, oh, it is a threat, but it's not up applicable for this particular machine. And yeah, Amira basically helps us to, to figure this out because even for uh, a certain press that are for instance, our endpoint monitoring, say, our Windows only, we'll still get the alert, and then we'll have to figure out, is it seriously Windows only? For instance, some browser extensions, they don't really, uh, are related to, to any systems, so that's how we can um, also analyze it. Uh, are you planning any integrations with, like, sandboxing technologies, uh, Google, or anything like that? Yeah, so, Regarding sandboxing, uh, so this is purely sort of for forensics collection. So there is no sample collection. Obviously, it would be uh, very interesting to connect it also with something that could process a sample. But uh, then we are sort of approaching this problem of how we are transferring the samples along the way. So for instance, Google uh, Rapid Response Framework, they do something that allows you to pick a sample. And I guess at that point in time, we would be able also to uh, have some more reliable analysis when it comes to the file. So, so far we are operating basically on file hashes, I guess, file names, things like that. Uh, I mean, URLs are pretty okay. Like sometimes we are basically collecting a sample from the original URL rather than from the uh, machine. Uh, because also maybe sort of to give you a, a heads up on all this remediation process, apart from just getting rid of the threat on particular instance. Uh, what we are trying to do as well is uh, block domains, block IP addresses serving malware. So at this point of time, actually, it is more important for us where this threat got from and if we are able to pinpoint it to particular domain URL and get a sample there, then we know we have to block it, right? So it's, it's actually more related to what we are doing later in the step. So now that you're now that you're able to collect a lot more and analyze a lot more at scale, is there have you found particular things that you've uh, particular indicators or particular types of data you've collected now that were not worth collecting before? Uh, that were not worth that collecting. Weren't, weren't worth collecting before because they were data. too expensive. Yeah. So there are particular parts of forensics collection done by OSX Collector. It tries to get as much information as possible. That's why this 30K lines for machine that was running, I guess, for several months. Uh, and then the whole analysis process is also longer because of that. Uh, yeah, we decided, for instance, not to look too much into cookies collected on the browser. There were several issues actually with that. Also that collecting cookies value from someone's machines is a security uh, issue in the first place because you're collecting lots of information that should not leave a machine, or there is assumption it's not leaving a machine. Mm. Sometimes we get some uh, noise related to, to one of the filters, so there are filters that try to extract domains from particular URLs. Uh, there are also uh, filters that try to create kind of a network graph of related files, so for instance, if you have some related files to the one that's impacted, maybe it's potentially interesting to look at them as well. And these are most of the part too noisy to be actually taken seriously. We, we very seldom look at them. 
on the latest Mac hacks that are out there using GPU graphics attack, are you looking at those? Uh, not really. <laughs> I'm not too familiar with them. I was wondering if you um, keep your OSX collector files and periodically rerun them, you know, as your threat feed updates, and if that's proven any of any value to you. Yeah. So, so far, what we are doing, we are keeping the uh, malware. Uh, forensics uh, that we collected from the machines. Uh, we are not, Amira yet is not uh, too stateful. Apart from this cache that I've mentioned earlier, it's not uh, creating any state. There was actually a project uh, that was presented at SignCon in Utah last year, uh, where people were trying basically to also put all this information. Uh, I think it was MongoDB, but you may think of, okay, let's put it in something like Elasticsearch Cluster or Splunk let's query it. So these are potential next steps for this project basically. Apart from just taking as uh, like one machine individually, let's try to see how this machine differs from all the other machines in the network. This is actually something that OS Query is able to do for instance, like having the whole fleet of machines and trying to compare one machine against all others in the, in the, in the same um, infrastructure. What's the runtime of uh, collection and a mirror? I mean, how long does it take on each laptop and how long does it take to process? So the whole collection process, so just purely OSX collector script, it does rely on how basically, for how long time the machine was used. If the machine was used for several years, you will, and for instance, like browser history is not purge, like you have lots of apps installed, it, it may take quite some time. Uh, then the whole, anal so like worst case, like, you know, up to a day, let's say. Yeah, yeah, we had the cases when it was like running for a day, like it was still in the good old days of help desk engineers trying to uh, get the machine. Right now, as we are running it by our inventory management system, we, to be honest, we don't collect too much insight about when the uh, collection was started and then when the collection was finished. We only know this time when the collection was finished. So you don't know if the, collection was, took so long because user, for instance, was not in the office for like a day and his machine didn't be up to the central inventory management system. In the best case, I had actually on my, uh, when I was preparing the, the, the presentation, I had a case when the whole collection and analysis process, so also running analysis, which, which, which can also may take up to yeah, another several hours. It took eight minutes basically from collection to, to having the results uh, available for, for the malware analyst to, to look at. You mentioned the started doing proactive collection. Um, have you looked at collecting that data and trending on the data over time in something like Elasticsearch or Kibana? Yeah, so this is something we are not doing yet, but definitely uh, something I'd like to work as a, as a next steps basically after we automated all of this. Uh, kind of similar with respect to active defense. Do you guys have a particular threshold that you have to meet um, in order before you de uh, deploy the script, or do you just kind of have the script, you know, already uh, available to run on machines, and you run it across all your machines, or do you again, or do you have to reach a threshold? So, uh, yes, we we do have something like a threshold. It's basically this alerts we get from endpoint monitoring or network monitoring. So this is our initial kind of trigger for the whole malware, malware incident response process. But then we had some cases in the past when we were suspecting part of the fleet to be infected with something. And then with just one click, we were able to deploy the script to like hundreds of machines, get the analysis done by the next day and look at this. So it's way more scalable than our previous approach in this matter. What kind of file sizes does OSX Collector like put out? Like, have you seen? Uh, file there? size yeah. in terms of the, the collection, yeah. So I'm not sure if it was actually on the slide, but uh, the compressed Tor GZ file, it's usually several megabytes. If you decompress it, it's like, I don't know, 60 megabytes, 80 megabytes, something like that. Okay, any other questions still? Okay, and no, thank you, Kuba. Let's yeah. hear it for him. Sorry.